Who here is happy that Gordon's home? And who's happy that Carol's here? I'm glad we didn't get a split vote on that. That would have been a hard thing to have to explain. Well, good morning. Welcome to Bay Presbyterian Church and our worship of the living God. It's good to have you here with us today. We've got like a gajillion announcements. Matter of fact, I think there's more announcements than there are sermons today. So uh, just uh, let's uh, blow through these here. First of all, October, open nominations for elder. There's a sheet in your bulletin. Uh, take it home and uh, read it over. And uh, if you want to participate in that, then uh, there's white cards in the pew racks, and you can avail yourselves of those. Gordon, um, do, is there going to be choir rehearsal this week? Well, it's a funny thing that you should ask such a question. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, it's finally approaching us. This coming Tuesday is the first choir practice of the fall season. We're going to be here at 6 o'clock. And uh, I hope to have as many people here as we have right now. Um, you, you just show up, um, the choir members, uh, uh, it's not rigorous, just have to love the Lord, love to sing about the Lord, and we invite you to come. About an hour rehearsal, I always say about. <laughs> we might go over five minutes. But uh, a wonderful time of uh, worship and fellowship this Tuesday at 6, and we'll sing a couple of Sundays in a row after that. All right, very good. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Uh, next week is Staff Appreciation Sunday. We do this uh, every year, and uh, this is time for us to celebrate our staff, your very excellent staff. And so um, we're going to have a, a, a barbecue lunch afterwards, and uh, everything's going to be provided. All you need to do is come and bring your appetites. And um, I need to get from you an idea of who's going to be coming, how many is going to be coming, because we have to order food. So up for the hands. If you're going to come, if you feel like you can come to that next week. Okay. I count 63. <laughs> You'll understand later. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so, Linda, 65, 70. Um, next, uh, let's see. Not this Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday. Rachel, you're going to help me with this announcement. Because I can't, I'm just going to mess it up again. All right. So, um, last week, we discussed that we were going to have an Operation Christmas Child packing party. Um, there were a lot of announcements last week, and there was a little bit of a mix-up. Uh. Um, <laughs> Excuse me? There, there, there was. <laughs> uh, so there, uh, there was a little bit of a mistake. Um, everyone was said to have been invited to this Operation Christmas Child packing party, but in actuality, it is just the women. So for you men who are looking forward to coming, I am so sorry. <laughs> so yes, women, this is for you. Um, we're doing this in combination with our monthly uh, ladies' luncheon. Uh, so we're doing something a little bit different. Um, and I, Elaine and Jane just wanted to let you guys know that they are very thankful for um, all the efforts that you guys have made in putting the boxes that we already have together as well as the generous financial uh, donations that have been received as well. Um, so what Elaine Hubble and Jane Kelly have done is they've gone out and they've taken those generous donations and they've bought um, basic supplies to fill at least 20 boxes. Um, so we are looking for uh, people who will complete those boxes. Elaine says the one thing that they are missing are what we call a wow item, okay? So um, what we would like you to do is if you are planning on coming, we would like you to sign up at the podium over by the door just to let us know that you're coming um, so that we can make sure that we have enough lunches for everyone because we will be providing a box lunch from Chick-fil-A. Um, so we hope that you can come. It will be a wonderful time to meet new people as well as to grow in your relationships 
with the people that you already know. So we hope that you can come, and we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, um, let's see. One, let's see, I got another one. Hang on a second. So, uh, first of all, make sure you sign up. I kind of blew that announcement next week. I'll, I'll give you that. Okay. All right, now, uh, on the 29th of this month, we're having uh, a Remember When party. This is the first time we've done this. It's a Remember When party. And um, it's, a, it's a sort of a nostalgic trip back into the past. And we're going to have a, uh, we're going to supply food, and then we're going to have a, uh, some trivia contests. But also, if you have mm, a poodle skirt and bobby socks, pull it out of the mothballs and wear it. If you have your finest miniskirt, pull it out of the mothballs. And, uh, and so, uh, or if you have men, if you have Nehru jackets and leisure suits, bring them, bring them, wear them. So actually, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have awards for, prizes will be awarded for the best costume. And, and, uh, and then also, if you could bring a picture from the 50s, 60s, or 70s of yourself, that's going to, we're going to use that to help us with our trivia. And so, uh, so if you would please uh, either send those pictures into uh, Ginny or bring those pictures into Ginny, then we would appreciate it. You can either send it uh, by uh, text or email or else you can actually bring the picture in. Okay. I told you we've got a lot of announcements. Now, if you, if you had noticed... Lunita. Lunita has, she looks different today. The reason why she looks different is because she has with her her three sisters from Chile. It is Marinka and Gina and Fanny. Those are her three sisters, and we're going we're gonna to send them back to Chile as missionaries, and they're going to do Operation Christmas Child boxes back in Chile at their churches. And so we're gonna, we're gonna spread the news out. Now they didn't know that until just now. <laughs> but now there's some kind of accountability. Okay, and then we have uh, Colin. Colin, would you stand up? This young man is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and... <laughs> Active duty Air Force just back from a deployment. So we thank the good Lord for you. We pray for you regularly. And finally, finally, we have with us here today the new executive director of the Pregnancy Resource Center. Her name is Nicole Shanks. And uh, she is here. Thrilled to have her here. And uh, I have a few questions for you. Okay, I'm ready. First of all, Nicole, the Pregnancy Resource Center is certainly well known to us here at Bay Presbyterian Church, but we're a growing congregation. Some people don't know about the, the PRC. Very br briefly, what is it at the PRC that you and they do? Well, first off, thank you so much for inviting me here today. This is my first church speaking engagement, and John said, you can come and practice on my congregation. So thank you. I think I'm getting the nerves out here, but you're all very, very nice, so I'm happy to be here. Um, I started at the end of August, and the Pregnancy Resource Center is made up of a couple of clinics. We have one in North Naples, one in the Fort Myers area, and we have an education center, a baby boutique, and we are for women with an unplanned pregnancy. Our mission is to prevent abortion and present eternal truth. And we do this with a team of medical staff, uh, with many volunteers. And uh, what we do is when they come in for an appointment, uh, we uh, provide medical-based uh, pregnancy confirmation 
with an ultrasound, and I kind of think that is part of our secret sauce, because we do the ultrasound, and we have big screens on our walls, and we show them the baby. And about six and a half, seven weeks, you can begin to see that heartbeat. And so we show them that heartbeat. We use the word baby a lot. We say, do you see your baby? Do you see that heartbeat? We can turn up the volume. We can let them listen to the baby's heartbeat. And the heartbeat is fast. If you remember that from ultrasounds years ago, it's about 120 to 170 beats per minute. So we let them hear that heartbeat, um, show them the baby. And then we also have volunteer advocates. And these are women that have a lot of training. They go in the room with the patient and they begin just to ask them questions and begin to learn like, what are your concerns? What are your obstacles? Uh, what are the challenges that you face in life? Why do you think that maybe you can't carry this baby? And then after we learn what the obstacles are, then we can begin to provide solutions. So maybe it's material assistance or education or support um, and begin to kind of chip away at, at what those obstacles are. You, you have had uh, in your career, your, your background is as, a, as a, a, an OB, um, OB, OBGYN nurse, yes, oh, and labor and delivery. <laughs> I always have trouble spelling that. <laughs> yeah, and so you, you've been around this a little bit. What, about this particular ministry, what excites you? Oh my goodness, everything. I can't, I can't believe that I get to do this. So truly, I think we all want to wake up in the morning excited about what we get to do, how we get to use the gifts and talents God has given us to impact others for the good. And uh, I'm, I'm motivated by our mission to save these babies and to transform women's lives and uh, through the gospel and through resources. And I get to work with a fabulous team. There's such energy and aliveness with the team I get to work with. See, you see all these happy faces here? Mm -hmm. How can we help you in your ministry? Uh, you know, first and foremost, prayer. I, I believe the power of prayer helps tremendously. And so we use a tool called Hope Sync. And you can sign up uh, for the prayer requests. And so literally in real time, we will text you uh, prayer requests. And it'll say something like, uh, pray for advocate Jenny and a patient that is abortion-minded right now. And you can know that in real time, we have a woman in the clinic that is truly considering an abortion. So prayer is huge. Um, also, we have a walk for life coming up on December 4th. And I have information at a table back there about our walk for life. And lastly, volunteering. So we do exist on many, many volunteers. And so there's many ways to volunteer as an advocate with the patients and also just in the admin offices or helping with events. I saw a, a table in the back that had a bunch of paraphernalia on it. Will you be back there to kind of help? And if anybody has any questions about what you're doing, will you be willing to stay around afterwards? And, I sure will. And show people. I sure will. Thank Very you. Very good. Thank, Thank you, Nicole. We appreciate your goodness. Now, let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, church family. Another beautiful Sunday in October. The call to worship is on the inside page of your church bulletin. Today we are reading 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to ever everlasting, Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. 
Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise for the glorious name. First hymn, stand with me. The God of Abraham prays. God and Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, God, we are here today to praise you and to, to sing your excellencies. Thank you. In you is beauty and glory and holiness. And God, we seek today just to catch a glimpse of that. And we pray that as we worship today, you might be with us and in us and among us so that our worship might be in spirit and in truth. And as we leave this place today, God, our desire is that we will be able to say today we have met with Almighty God. Hear us, O oh God, we make our prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who lived and died and rose again and who while on this earth taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you and please be seated.
This is the reading of the word of God. Colossians 2, 9 through 23. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. that he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, ins insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish, that are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, if our ushers will come forward, we'll continue our worship of Almighty God as we present to him our tithes and offerings. Would you bow for prayer with me? A great God and Heavenly Father, how we give you thanks and praise for the prosperity that we enjoy from your hand. Uh, we thank you for taking care of our needs and, and uh, for the abundance that we have above and beyond our needs. And now, God, as we return to you, just a piece of what you have given to us, we pray that you might bless these gifts and multiply them, using them to build your church here in Southwest Florida and to the ends of the earth. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus, who is indeed our strong Savior. Amen. If you haven't noticed, we have a Hebrew theme going in our worship this morning. And uh, we're going to continue that Hebrew theme. And uh, it's called Sing Unto the Lord a New Song. And I guess I'm going to ask that Jim put those words up because I don't want you to use the sheets of paper because your hands are going to be busy. <laughs> so uh, it goes something like this. If you want to sing along, that's great, Carol. Let's, let's do it the first time with them. Ready? Go. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Great, you can sing with us now. Ready, go. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Yeah, one more time. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. The next section has your hand busy also because we're going to clap. There are two X's that mean. So, Carol, show them more in the clap. Here we go. For God is rich. And greatly to be praised. God is great and greatly to be praised. Now that place right there.
right there, you put your hands up and you worship your God. And if you want to wave, you can. But God is to be worshipped and praised with our hands also. So let's do that together. For God is great. For God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great and greatly to be praised. Great. Now the only thing is, we have a wonderful, I've talked about this before, we have wonderful acoustics in this place, but I hear more clapping than I do. For God is great. I want to hear that, because that, that's what the scripture is all about. Here we go. For God is great. Two, three, four. For God is great. And greatly to be praised. God is great. And greatly to be praised. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord of the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Would you rise to your feet, please? Standing, please. Here we go, from the beginning, and sing, sing unto, unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord on the earth, sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord, repeat that, sing unto the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, come on, sing unto the Lord on the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. For God, for God is great and greatly to be praised. For God is great and greatly to be praised. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord one more time. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord on the earth. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord Hey! And you may be seated. Now, I had a wonderful experience this past week where Annie taught me a new song. And uh, she's going to sing a new song, and we get to, to listen and to use it as part of our worship as uh, the morning progressive progresses. And also, this week, as I'm sure you're going to remember this beautiful, beautiful song. Am I on? Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage, your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle descending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. You yes, John. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice for the victory is yours. So put on the armor the Lord has. Place your defense. 
trust him, for he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage, for he will provide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord. Be strong for the victory. Thank you, Annie. That's the message of Joshua, isn't it? Be strong in the Lord and stand in the strength of his might. Isn't that right? All right. Good. You have a prayer sheet in your bullet. I'd ask you to pull that out. Take a look down there. You'll see Colin's name there in that top, in that top tranche there. And um, Colin Klopp right there. So uh, pick out two or three of these things for which you'd pray. Uh, pray silently, and I'll conclude this after a time. Let's go to God in prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for that admonition that we just heard from your word to Stand strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Uh, God, uh, you, you, you entreated Joshua to be strong and courageous. And uh, God, it is our mission to be strong and courageous, to fight for every inch of our spiritual lives now that we have tasted and seen that indeed the Lord is good. God, we thank you that we can uh, gather and worship and praise you and sing and that we can enter into your very throne room with boldness and expectation. Your promise is that you will hear us, God, and we thank you for that. And God, we, we come before you now for those who are in need of prayer. We pray for our nation's military as, uh, as they are uh, day by day in treacherous situations. And we pray that you'd bring them safety and strength. God, we pray for our 
the same for our first responders and uh, our teachers, our, our doctors, our nurses, EMTs and police and firemen. God, we pray that you would bring blessing to them for the sacrifices they make, that they run into trouble and not away from it. Thank you for them and pray your blessing on them. God, we pray for those who are struggling with issues of uh, health. Thank you that uh, right up the top we see Pete Roberts' name and here he is sitting right in our midst. We thank you for delivering him from his pneumonia and, and, uh, and God, we pray that you would keep him strong and healthy. And God, we pray for, uh, for everybody on this list. God, for, uh, for, for Jackie, for Bill, who we see with us today as well. God, we thank you for the evidences that we see of your working and, and pray that you might uh, continue to work in these people's lives, that you would draw near to them, that they might sense your presence and draw strength from that. Thank you for the good ministries with which we're associated. We think of the, the Pregnancy Resource Center and the good work Nicole and her team are, are doing. Um, and uh, God, we would pray as well for Derek Creter and Catalina and their ministry in Romania and for uh, Eric Hauser, Christ the King, Presbyterian Church. God, we pray for that ministry that, uh, that today those people would be privileged in worship and their worship would be deep, and that people might find opportunity to know the Savior. God, we ask your blessing now on, on our time together in the Scriptures. May Christ be glorified in these next few moments, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to say that I neglected to say earlier, um, if you are interested in coming to um, our um, remember when uh, party on the 29th. We have sign-up sheets because, again, we need to get food. So we're going to have a sign-up sheet on this uh, podium over here to my left by the front door, and then we have another sign-up sheet in the back behind Mike Collins. Mike, leave that. Don't take that sign-up sheet with you. All right. Very good. So please uh, give us uh, your name so we can know how much to plan on. Okay, one of the things that I have been learning, um, learning about partly intentionally and partly by happenstance is uh, the idea of memory. Does anybody have trouble with their memory at all? Anybody? Let's do it this way. Is anybody not having trouble with their memory? <laughs> No hands on that one, none. <laughs> As the years go by, it seems like our, our memory is becoming more and more suspect. And, and the interesting thing about that is our memories don't uniformly degrade. Yeah, you, you, the, the, look around. I mean, the people who are sitting next to you, their, their memory, are, they're not degrading at the same speed as yours is. Maybe faster, maybe slower, but you know, you, you think about um, a guy, remember Bob DeNoyer? He is with the Lord now, but when he was 95 years old, 95 years old, he stood right where I'm standing and he gave us his Gideon talk, 20 minute Gideon talk. He had not one single note in front of him, not one note. He was as sharp right to the day he went to be with the Lord. Uh, he had a, a sharp mind. And now, compare and contrast that with me, because for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking to you, and I have 12 pages of notes. Our brains are really amazing when you think about it. Yeah, think, of, think about what your brain does. Now, I'm talking to you right now. And, and the reason why I'm talking to you right now is because there are some things going on in my head. There are chemicals colliding. There are electrical impulses that are firing. They're, they're pulling information some way, somehow stored in our brain. You ever think about that? I mean, I could understand a filing cabinet and files, but it's, it's on electrical impulses in your brain. 
And some way, somehow, my brain decodes that. And then I can talk in a way that's intelligible to most people. For some of you, it puts you to sleep. For others, it's intelligible. And then you remember what I say, which means that that information goes into your ear, into your brain, and is stored in some way that you can make sense out of it, and maybe even next week come back and say, yeah, I remember that you said that. Now, you see, the brain is just, it's remarkable. There, there are 100 billion neurons in your head, 100 billion neurons. If the neurons were the size of a grain of sand, they're really much smaller than that, but if, if they were just the size of a grain of sand, it would fill up about 8,500 soda cans. That's a, that's a lot of stuff to f fit into your head, isn't it? And the job of the neurons is to send signals between cells. Each one of our 100 billion neurons has about 10,000 opportunities to form connections with neighboring neurons. So you can see that the brain is very sophisticated and needs to be exercised in order to keep our age-diminishing number of neurons working. Different factors lead to the inefficiencies and declining neuron status. So because of that, and count on it, it's happening to everybody, and because of that, it's wise to, de to develop mnemonic memory devices and techniques to help us. It has historically been the study of philosophers and institutions of higher learning. You could actually go and take classes on memory. How do you remember things? Uh, back in the 5th and 6th century BC, Plato and Aristotle often spoke and wrote about memory techniques and around uh, and, it, and it went forward. So there was no lack of, of personage that would write about how you remember things. And at the end of the 16th century AD, a German scholar who taught memory in France and Italy and Germany surprised people with his memory, so much so that he was denounced as a sorcerer. Now that's why I pretend to forget sometimes. <laughs> I don't want you thinking of me as a sorcerer. But some techniques historically were quite complicated, but some are quite simple. And you probably employ memory techniques in ways that you don't even realize that you're doing. Um, among the techniques that you use and don't realize it, well, the first one is music. Calvin, John Calvin said that when he went into Geneva, when he first started his ministry in Geneva, Switzerland, the very first thing he wanted to do was, was to teach hymns to people because by hymns, people learned theology. And the hymns, the music that went with the words enabled them to remember. And you do the same thing. You might not realize it, but you do. Like, for instance, Gordon, I'm going to need you on this for a second. You got me. Okay. Um, we're coming up on Christmas. Are we going to do Christmas carols this year? Yes. Okay. So we're going to sing Christmas carols this year, and you know some of those Christmas carols. Um, well, you know, the, one, of the, one of the top Christmas carols, Joy to the World. I, I, I want you, in a second, Gordon's going to play Joy to the World, and I want you, as he's playing the notes, I want you to put the words with the notes. Okay, Gordon, joy to the world. Oh, no. Are you, are you through yet? <laughs> Not that one. What? What? It's not the right one, is it? I don't think it is. I th it, in your book is... Uh, Okay, okay, try that one, try that one. Okay. Okay, now tell me, what were the words that go with those notes? There you go, you see? 
you have that in your memory. All those neurons are grasping hold of that and keeping it because you have music to help you. Thank you, Gordon. I appreciate oh, you're welcome. not all the help you gave me, but the, <laughs> the latter part of it. Another memory technique we use is, is by using names. We attach names to something. Like, for instance, do you know all the colors? Of, can you say the colors of the rainbow? Roy G. Bibb. I heard it over here. Roy G. Bibb. See, that's a name. You attach a name, Roy G. Bibb. Red, orange, yellow, uh, G, Roy G. Green, blue, indigo, and violet. Roy G. Bibb. And that's how you remember it. You use a name to help you remember something. Words. Uh, sometimes when you put words together, make sentences out of it. And uh, this is, you, may, you may have done this in order to use passwords on, your, on some of your accounts on the, on the computer. But um, for instance, in mathematics, there's an order in which you do things. You, you do certain functions in a, in a particular order. And for instance, you start out with whatever's in parentheses, and then you go to, next you do exponents. So parentheses, that's P, exponents is E, then you multiply, M, divide, D, add, A, and subtract. So that's P-E-M-D-A-S. And so you might say, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. You see that? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally tells you, parenthesis, exponents, multiply, uh, divide, add, and subtract. I forgot my dear Aunt Sally there for a minute. Pictures help us. Pictures help jog our memory. If I were just to, to give you a picture of a club on a playing card, you wouldn't need me to write club underneath. You just know that that's a club or a diamond uh, or a spade or a heart. You would just know what those things are. So pictures help us. Rhymes help us. Uh, here's one. In what year did Columbus sail the ocean blue? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That's, that's a memory technique that helps us to remember. Outlines. Outlines help us organize information so it's not just a bunch of disparate facts uh, moving around in our head. Uh, an outline helps us. You have an outline in your bulletin that's, that you can kind of track where I'm going. If you are paying attention to that outline, you know that I'm not very far into my sermon, and yet the <laughs> clock is ticking. But outlines help us uh, organize information and therefore help us remember. And then one that we all use a lot, sometimes subconsciously, sometimes consciously, but we use associations. If you got bit by a dog while you're going down the street, you might avoid that street because you remember the pain associated with that street. Um, and, and we use it all the time. See, do you see the words on the front of this table? Dan, what does that say right there? This do in remembrance of me. This do in remembrance of me. See, Jesus gave us things by which we remember. Association. That association helps us to remember. Now, the reason why I'm laboring the point is because last week and this week are largely about remembering. You remember from last week, God stopped up the flow of the Jordan River, making that river at flood stage passable for the entire nation of Israel, largely thought of as impossible in the day. And afterwards, there were two piles of stones that were erected. One was on the opposite shore for the Israelites to remember by association, and that, that miracle that God did drying, it, drying up the Jordan River as he had done so also with the Red Sea some 35 plus years before. And then there was a second pile of stones Joshua built himself in the riverbed so he would remember the day when God reaffirmed his leadership, remembering by association. Now, the story that we're considering today is actually an extension of last week's story. And I want us to take a look at Joshua chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Um, the necessary points as we need them, we'll call them out, and they'll be on the screen so you could kind of follow along. Um, you also have it in your bulletin, and there's Bibles under your chair. 
The first thing we see in this uh, particular passage is intimidation by inference. Intimidation by inference. See, Joshua 5 starts off with a tidbit of information. You may recall that 38 plus years before, God told them to go into Canaan. It was a very short time. We don't know how short that time is, or we don't know how long that time was, but it was shortly after crossing the Red Sea. And the people refused to go into the promised land from Kadesh Barnea. They said that there were giants in the land, and they themselves thought of themselves as grasshoppers. Well, we have a similar situation setting up here. It is the same land with the same tribes of people that are inhabiting the land. And verse 1 of Joshua chapter 5 tells us, that, tells us that the Canaanites were completely dispirited when they heard that Jehovah had dried up the Jordan River. They heard of the miracle and they knew that it had to be of God. So they inferred, properly inferred, that it was God who was with them in this miracle. And so they were finished. They were completely intimidated by the inference that if God could could stop up the Jordan River. They could stomp them. And we read this in Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. As soon as the kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites, who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted And there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Intimidation by inference. The second thing we see in this passage is the sacraments of circumcision and Passover. Our Westminster Confession of Faith, which is our our standard, our, our doctrinal standard, states that sacraments are holy signs and seals of the... When it says seals, it doesn't mean seals like you seal a lid on a jar. Seal, you make a mark on it, like a a king would use his signet ring to put a seal on an an important letter or or some contract or something like that. Uh, So the sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace immediately instituted by God. Some would, would say that, that sacraments are outward signs of an inward experience. And we might say a mnemonic device, sacraments are, are remembering by association. We're familiar with the new covenant sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. There was also some Old Testament, Old Covenant sacraments that gave way to the new covenant sacraments. And those old covenant sacraments were circumcision and baptism. Rachel read a little earlier out of Colossians 2. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. Baptism followed circumcision. It was the continuation, the new covenant continuation of circumcision. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we always quote the words of our Lord Jesus. He says, this is the blood of the new covenant. And of course, it is the fruit of the vine. What you may not know is that at the first Passover feast, Moses took the blood of the Passover lamb And he sprinkled it on the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant. And Jesus would say, this is the blood of the new covenant. So in both instances, you have holy signs and seals, visible markings of the covenant of grace instituted by God. And by these signs, God reminds them of who they are. God is the God of the covenant. When God made a covenant with Abraham, remember the God of Abraham prays? When God made a covenant with Abraham and his posterity, he did so by cutting. 
he cut animals in half. And the sign of the, of the, of the first covenant was circumcision, cutting, the cutting of flesh. So in the Bible, when it says God made a covenant, it literally says God cut a covenant. And it's at least partly where we get the phrase, you cut a deal. That's what a contract is. A contract is a deal. It's a covenant. And so when you execute a contract, you are cutting a deal, just like they cut a covenant in the Old Testament day when they cut the animals and then cut the flesh. This is foreshadowed in, in Joshua chapter 4, because in Joshua chapter 4 last week we read this. It says, Then you shall tell your children the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. Again, that strong cutting idea. And this underscores the close connection between cutting and the covenant. The two Old Testament covenant ceremonies, if you will, were accompanied by the shedding of blood. The New Testament covenant ceremonies do not require the shedding of blood. Why? Because the blood of Christ was shed once and for all, so we put aside the bloody signs. Now, this part of the story and this piece of scripture tells us two things. First of all, be distrustful. Be distrustful of outward means of securing your peace with God. Some people feel confident because they have been baptized. Baptism, as we see in this passage, just as circumcision did not mean peace with God. Circumcision was an outward means of understanding one's place in the covenant, that God would be a God to us, to the children of Abraham, and that we would be his people. The people who came out of Egypt bore the outward sign of the covenant, circumcision, yet the Bible calls them an unbelieving generation, and they perished in the wilderness. So the sacraments remind us to make sure our faith, to consider what Christ did for us, his blood shed once and for all. So the reproach or the blame and shame of our sin is now rolled away. I ask you this question today. Can you say for certain that you believe in the Lord Jesus as your lamb? Can you say that that the Lord Jesus was your Passover lamb, that his blood was shed for you. If you can't say that, then perhaps today is the day when you will say, I want Jesus' blood to cover my sins and to roll back God's displeasure with my sin. But there's a second part of this. And that is Gilgal. Gilgal, we're told right in the passage, Gilgal, that word Gilgal means rolled away. And God, it says, rolled away the reproach of Egypt. Reproach means uh, blame uh, or shame. And God rolled away the blame and shame of Egypt. Egypt is often used to represent, in the Bible, slavery and slavery to sin. Since it was a pagan land and the Hebrews were enslaved there. Now, when the Hebrews set foot on the west bank of the Jordan River, their slavery had ended. They were free. And when by faith we believe in Jesus, we are free of the blame of our sin. And we read all this in Joshua chapter 5 from verses 2 down to verse 10. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeah Haraluth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, 
had died in the wilderness on their way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, the Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, for, their, for they were uncircumcised because they had not, were, had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcision of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their place in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is Gilgal to this day. And while the people were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th month, day of the month in the evening of the plains of Jericho. Okay, finally we have in this passage from manna to matzah. This passage ends on a transitional note. No one likes change. No one likes transitions. Sometimes they don't go well, but sometimes they do. And the transition that Joshua is involved in here went very well. For 40 years, God had fed the people manna. Every day, people had enough to eat, and they didn't have to go far for it. It was right at their feet. The people learned to trust God every day for their sustenance, and God delivered every day. But it was kind of bland. You remember, after a few days of manna, they said, how about some meat? It was sufficient, but it wasn't exciting. But when they got to the promised land, they got exciting as well as sufficient. You remember in Kadesh Barnea, they said they had grapes the size of basketballs. Now, basketball is my translation of that. But they had gigantic grapes that they were eating. All the produce was abundant and huge. But it wasn't at their feet. They would have to cultivate the ground in order to get it. Dale Ralph Davis tells the story of Dr. John Witherspoon. Dr. John Witherspoon was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was also a Presbyterian pastor and the president of the College of New Jersey, which is now called Princeton. And he lived a couple of miles away from the college in Rock Hill and, and drove a horse-drawn rig into his office every day. And one day, one of his neighbors... Uh, burst into his office and exclaimed, Dr. Witherspoon, you must join me in giving thanks to God for his extraordinary providence in saving my life. For as I was driving from Rock Hill to the house, my horse, or to, the, to your office, my horse ran away and the buggy was smashed to pieces on the rocks, but I escaped unharmed. Dr. Witherspoon replied, why, I can tell you a far more remarkable providence than that. I've driven over that same road hundreds of times, but my horse never ran away, and my buggy was never smashed, and I was never hurt. So, Dale Davis says, we must beware of thinking that God is only in the exciting that God is only in the earthquake, in the wind, in the fire, of thinking that manna but not grain is God's food. Just because the Israelites knew, knew food would be by the sweat of their brow, now, instead of laying down at their feet, it's no less a miracle. Don't lose the miracle in the mundane. God's providence was and is in the mundane as well as the spectacular. That's why God gives us holy signs and seals so we can remember. This we read in verses 11 and 12. 
And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain, and the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. And that's the story. That's the story of the crossing of the Jordan and of the sacraments that were celebrated afterwards. So, what is the takeaway? What is the takeaway? Well, the first of the takeaways is the power of God weakens the knees of unbelief. The power of God weakens the knees of unbelief. When the Canaanites heard of the power of God to stop the river, that power melted their hearts and their resolve. It had happened before. When the Canaanites had camped in Kadesh Barnea some 38 years before, the, the, the parting of the Red Sea struck fear into the hearts of the Canaanites. And had the Hebrews advanced from the south when God first told them to go, they would have taken over Canaan without firing, having to fire a shot. The people of Canaan were prepared to surrender. Why? Because they heard of the God of the Israelites, not because of the Israelites, but because of the God of the Israelites who had the power to part the Red Sea. Instead, the Hebrews refused to advance and ended up wandering aimlessly for 38 years, and an entire generation perished in the wilderness. God can tear down the walls of unbelief so that even the hardest hearts will melt and surrender to God the Holy Spirit. You see, that's why I'm praying for Chairman Xi Jinping. And by the way, I've added Vladimir Putin to my list. <laughs> I figure if we could do it with Xi Jinping, we could certainly do it with Vladimir Putin. But you see, it's not just, remember, it's, it's the mundane as well as the spectacular. Because that pesky neighbor of yours is not beyond the reach of the gospel as well. Pray for that neighbor because the power of God weakens the knees of unbelief, even of giants. Second, the power of God rolls away shame and blame. God rolls away shame by rolling away blame. Every one of us, like we said last week, have those episodes in our past that makes us shiver in shame when we think about them. These are things we don't share with anyone. It's too shameful for us to do that. But the fact of the matter is that though we sometimes don't believe it, God took away the blame as we read earlier, by nailing it to the cross so that the Apostle Paul would write in Romans 8 and verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How is that possible? Because on the cross, God heaped our sin and its blame and shame on Jesus so that Jesus already has paid the price. So the blame is gone and with it the shame. One commentator said this, when the pain of your past is in the present, it will conform your future to the past. So I say, in your memory, what is in your past? I hope you can say, what is in my past is Christ dying on the cross to take the shame and blame for my sin. Number three, the power of God takes us to heaven. It was the power of God that took the Hebrews across the river together. The promised land uh, biblically, is a metaphor for heaven. God took an impossibly difficult situation, a river at flood stage, and he fixed it. And so 
he, in so doing, he brought his people into their rest, into their promise. The power of God can bring even the most unlikely to heaven. The apostle wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. John Newton was the profane ship captain of a slave ship, and he was broken by being captured and himself sold into slavery. And he remembered his godly mother who was praying for him. And John Newton became a believer in Jesus Christ, this one-time slave trader. And then he became a pastor. He became the pastor of William Wilberforce, a British parliamentarian and tireless abolitionist. And John Newton would write this. He'd say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The power of God takes the most profane to heaven. If you think that you are beyond help, then think again, because you cannot out sin God's grace. Fourth and finally, the power of God provides for our soul. He gave bounty to the Hebrews in Canaan, and he offers us bounty by his word and spirit. We don't just go to church. We don't just do church. When you come on Sunday morning, you're not just doing church. You are worshiping. You are singing the excellencies and the beauties of Christ. And so it is that the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. There's no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that day. Would you pray with me? Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us uh, fruit, the fruit of uh, this new land, this, this, this community of believers who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and now we can eat of your word. And by the sacraments, uh, we remember by association, and so it is that we, we partake of Christ to the presence of our faith there. And so, God, we, we ask your blessing on, on this fellowship Help us, God, to worship and live our lives as living testimonies for the power of God, which could take even the vilest into heaven. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last hymn, would you stand with me as we sing, Lamb of God. Stand with me. Bye.
And now we receive God's benediction, for it is now unto Jesus who is able to keep you from falling. It's now unto Jesus who is able to present you before his glorious presence, spotless and with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be power, honor, glory, and dominion, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.